The lovely lads over at Blaze Entertainment have sent me an Evercade XP because a bunch of Duke Nukem games are getting released on their retro handheld today and, as it turns out, if there was ever a perfect synergy of product, influencer and target audience, it is me telling you lot what I think about a bunch of brand new Duke Nukem ports and emulations on a bespoke retro handheld. Finally, I've arrived. I'm an influencer. An influencer to a very small audience of 30 plus lads who just want to remember a few things about their childhood and stop thinking about the ever rapid passing of time for a few minutes. Now, I'll talk about the Evercade XP itself in future no doubt, but for now my focus is on the Duke Nukem releases and why these two carts represent some of Evercade's biggest moves to date and perhaps show a glimpse of their future. <laughs> First up, and for my money the biggest draw of this two-cart collection, Duke Nukem 1 and 2 Remastered. This title has been built for the Evercade hardware, not emulation like most of the other stuff on this platform, and for now anyway, is completely exclusive to Evercade. These original Duke Nukem games are, to be fair, decent little action platformers. They're both full of stuff to shoot, stuff to collect, secrets to be discovered and intricate levels to explore. The good shit, right? However, they did come from this period where console games were really dominant in this genre. The DOS PC game platformer, I guess, features like jerky screen movement, lack of animation, a smaller colour palette and PC speaker audio. It all meant that they paled in comparison to stuff like Super Mario Bros. 3, which was light years ahead in those particular departments. It's not that the Duke Nukem games aren't good, far from it, they're fantastic. It's just that they're quite hard sells to people who don't have any strong nostalgia for these games, that era of PC gaming, or just really, really like Duke Nukem. So although the games are playable in their original state on this cart, they have undergone some significant work, most of which makes them feel quite different and in my opinion, like much better games to play. This isn't a little lick of paint we're talking here, we're, we're talking like near night dive levels of remastering, you know. That whole making the game play like your rose-tinted memories of it. It's an idealistic approach to retro gaming. The most obvious and striking change is the inclusion of a 60fps smooth scrolling mode. This is a fucking revelation. The game instantly feels much slicker and more responsive, and actually more in line with the console action platformers that came out around its original release. I'm sure there are some DOS platformer stalwarts out there who think this is some sort of blasphemy, but honestly, it's not like the stuttery scrolling of the original was a design decision in any way at all. If they could have done this at the time, they would have, and the core experience of these games is retained even with what is quite a substantial change for the better. Another major change for the better is the inclusion of a 16x9 widescreen mode. This isn't just so the game takes up the appropriate real estate on most modern screens in the Evercade itself, it also provides you with a greater view of the play space and instantly makes exploration less of a pain in the ass. There's plenty of times when playing the classic version where you can't see enemies that are shooting at you from outside the playfield, or even see platforms that you might need to jump to, requiring quite a few leaps of faith to something that may or may not be off screen. Now, you can see where you're going, and again, this seems like the kind of inclusion that would have been added to the original releases of these games if the technology was available at the time. Now, I do get it if you're screaming at whatever it is that you're watching this video on right now about how this isn't the authentic Duke Nukem experience, or how this isn't the authentic DOS platformer experience, man. I get it. I really do. I, too, think that preserving games as they were originally released is good and important, and that concessions towards the modern gamer can sometimes ruin the original appeal of titles like this. I understand, I get it, but I'm also not going to lie to you. Not only do these modernizations improve these games, but they don't take away anything from the original experience. They round off some rough edges, they make them more fun to play, and hey, you can play the original style releases if you want and even switch between them in real time during a session. It's all good. You can even mix and match specific elements, which is really cool. There's some real care gone into this remaster. You can enable an all-new Duke Nukem series-inspired soundtrack, or an improved HUD that keeps track of things like keys and the Duke letters that you found, a couple of little quality of life tweaks like on-screen tutorials, save states, and between levels hints and tips. There's even things like a speedrunner mode. These really are definitive remasters of what were, for the longest time, two of the more forgotten Duke Nukem games. The other title on this first cart is Duke Nukem 3D Total Meltdown. Yes, the PS1 version. They're not particularly great, but far from terrible PS1 version. However, 
despite not being the definitive version of Duke 3D by any stretch, it's actually a really good fit for the Evercade hardware. See, the Evercade isn't a device blessed with dual analog sticks, so a port of the PC version would be a nightmare to control, and the N64 and Saturn ports would probably be an emulation headache. The PS1 version, however, is designed around the original digital PlayStation pad. Sure, both control schemes on offer take a little getting used to, with one prioritising the ability to look up and down using shoulder buttons and one, which is my personal choice, essentially making Duke 3D play a little bit like PlayStation Doom, with bullets automatically targeting enemies on their vertical plane as long as you're aiming in the right direction, and looking up and down requires holding a button to enable the ability to do so. Neither is perfect, but they work on the Evercade, and after a while they do become quite manageable. Every level from the PC original is present here, and that's for better and for worse. The game was notorious for its awful frame rate, and when you hit some of the larger areas, things tank considerably, and this unfortunately combines with the aforementioned less than ideal controls to make for an at times really messy experience. It's not so common that it ruins the experience, but it's definitely worth keeping in mind. There's also the inclusion of the PS1 exclusive episode, Plug and Pray, which has some levels based on Tomb Raider, Wipeout and Resident Evil, as well as a bunch of unique enemy types, which is actually a really nice touch, and this is something that's never been added into any of the PC Duke 3D re-releases over the years, for obvious reasons. So it, it's really cool to see here. Although this isn't the best version of Duke 3D, it is a good fit for the Evercade handheld, and once you've got your head around the control schemes, it is an impressive addition to the Evercade library. Duke Nukem 3D is, after all, one of the best video games of all time, regardless of the version, and it's a game that rounds off a cracking compilation. The second collection starts off with another PS1 title, the brilliant Duke Nukem Time to Kill. I've written about this game before in my newsletter, which you can find a link for in the description below if you fancy checking it out. It's free, please subscribe, etc. Anyway. I played it for about a year or so ago, after playing through the original three Tomb Raider games again, and where they offered really good tools for platforming, their whole thing kind of falls apart, especially in the latter two titles, when you have to deal with some of the more hectic combat situations. Duke Nukem Time to Kill feels like the polar opposite of that. It was released in 1998 when Lara Mania was running Wild Brother, and the first batch of Tomb Raider clones had started to drop into the market. Duke Nukem came with, unsurprisingly, a game with a much greater lean towards the action side of things. You've still got large environments to explore, solving puzzles within them and making your way to an exit, but Duke just is significantly more able to deal with all the threats that get in his way, and there's a lot of threats that get in his way, and it gives Time to Kill a much different feel. It's another PS1 game that was designed around the original PS1 pad, so again, it fits the Evercade hardware nicely, but with strafing map to L2 and R2 and a really generous and necessary auto-aim, you can actually get through some pretty hectic firefights with minimal fuss, and once you've gotten your head around a few basic fundamentals, like what range will trigger the auto-aim, you can have a really good time with this. Unfortunately, Duke's platforming abilities do leave a little bit to be desired, and there's nothing resembling Lara's precise grid-based movement. Everything feels a lot looser, and although this might initially make running and jumping across platforms feel more responsive, it ends up being far more of a hindrance. You see, when Lara Croft walks up to the edge of a platform and she takes that one big step backwards, you know, categorically, that you are going to get the maximum distance covered from a running jump, and everything in the game is built around that rule. In Time of Kill, there's no such thing. There's no accurate measuring marker, and once jumps get a little bit more challenging in the later levels, you can find yourself overrun the shooting platforms with alarming regularity. In the grand scheme of things, Duke's lack of platforming grace is less of a deal breaker than Lara Croft's inability to handle complex combat situations, so although it's definitely Time to Kill's weakest element, it's definitely not enough to ruin the overall experience. Where Time to Kill really shines, however, is in the sheer amount of variety on offer. Duke finds himself having to jump through various points in history to stop this alien menace, paying visits to the Old West, medieval England and ancient Rome, as well as stop-offs in present-day Los Angeles, albeit one that's shaped by the events that Duke is trying to stop. 
Not only is every level a very different look and vibe from one another, there's so many extra details that a lesser game just would have gone without. Enemies change their look to fit in with the era, Duke also dons an appropriate outfit, as well as finding period-specific weapons to add to his ever-growing arsenal. There's always something new or cool to do in every level in Time to Kill, and all the stages are quite different in terms of their structure and visual design, so it doesn't really get very repetitive. Most levels are built around a single, larger overall puzzle that requires you to track down three items to progress, and you can usually approach this in the order that you see fit. Like Tomb Raider, there's an emphasis on exploration and searching every nook and cranny of a level, each one filled with secrets for those who are willing to go the extra mile. It's not a long game, you can blast through it in about eight or so hours, but there's very little repetition. It's just a really fun romp from start to finish, and probably the best overall game on these cartridges. Up next is Duke Nukem Land of the Babes, the sort of sequel to Time to Kill that is another third person Duke Nukem adventure. I say sort of sequel because it is much shorter and it only has a few tweaks to the formula so it feels a little bit more like an expansion pack than anything else. The combat's a little tighter and it looks a little better, but that's about it. It is also the first Duke Nukem game to feature the ego mechanic, in that Duke no longer has a health bar, but taking damage actually damages his ego, which can be replenished by not only health pickups, but also killing enemies and saving the babes. Oh yeah, the babes. We're going to have to talk about the babes, aren't we? The plot to Duke Nukem Land of the Babes is a wild one. Basically, aliens have killed every man on Earth and used the remaining women for... Something not good. This basically means that there's loads of cutscenes where it's just lasses getting shot or dragged off by alien bastards for what is pretty grim means. They've managed to get Duke Nukem through a time portal from the past to come and save the day in his usual kicking ass and chewing bubblegum way. And there is a much greater focus on story this time around. There's more characters and they've all got more speaking parts, but as you've just heard, it's not exactly great. It does, however, have an absolutely mad ending where Duke seems to shag every woman remaining on the planet as part of Operation Repopulation. I'm not making this up. The questions this brings up, I don't even know where to start. The whole thing is just a little close to crossing what I call the Duke Nukem Forever line, where Duke's playful gimmick as a testosterone fueled action man saving the world's babes like only he can starts to get a little creepy and sometimes just downright nasty. I think it is just silly enough to stay on the right side of the line, but it's bloody close. And if you're making a Duke Nukem game, you never want to invoke comparisons to any aspect of Duke Nukem Forever. That is rule number one. Even if this came out years before it. Anyway, the whole plot thing notwithstanding, it does run great on the Evercade, and the improvements to the combat make it work really well with what the hardware offers control-wise. It's another decent addition to the cartridge. The final game in the second cart is a bit of a curio, it's Duke Nukem Advance, a totally unique, exclusive Duke Nukem first person shooter for the GBA that plays exactly how it sounds. A first person shooter developed for the Game Boy Advance. So the frame rate is often diving into some terribly low numbers, the level design is very simplistic and lacking in any verticality, so it feels almost like a Duke Nukem total conversion for Wolfenstein 3D, and enemies from the middle distance and beyond turn into a bunch of pixels that you can count on one hand, but despite all that, I do kind of like Duke Nukem Advance. Most of Duke's arsenal is here, alongside a bunch of enemies from Duke 3D, and the levels have Duke going from Area 51 to the Egyptian Pyramids to the Sydney Opera House on a globe-trotting, ass-kicking mission. It's all over in a couple of hours, fairly light and breezy, and the simple controls, move, shoot, use, and strafe on the shoulder buttons are all you really need to be able to navigate what is a fairly simplistic but also very impressive Game Boy Advance game. It's pretty hard to hate on this too much, and I think it's a nice little extra alongside two full-blown PS1 games. So let's get back to what I was saying at the start of this video, about the two carts maybe offering a bit of a glimpse into the future of Evercade. The Duke Nukem 1 and 2 remasters are currently exclusive to the Evercade platform and are designed to run on them from the ground up. Now although Evercade's whole thing is giving players these brilliantly curated retro collections that showcase classic games from a variety of different platforms, they've also started offering titles that are designed for the hardware, like the excellent Full Void and now actually remastering and offering what I consider the definitive version of Duke Nukem and its sequel. Perhaps they've got some other titles in the pipeline that are going to get this Evercade remaster treatment alongside their standard release. 
For me, it just shows that the platform is starting to become more and more its own thing, rather than just a place for retro collections. Not that there's anything bloody wrong with that. Overall, these two Duke Nukem collections are excellent. With most of the games being really enjoyable, they all work fantastically well with the Evercade hardware, and in the case of the exclusive Duke Nukem 1 and 2 remasters, are absolutely essential for fans of those games and similar DOS platformers from that era. It's just really nice to be reminded of a time before Duke Nukem Forever came and fucked it all up.